Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, this meeting of the executive. I'm Councillor Claire Douglas, and I'm leader of the council. And uh, the executive is one of the main decision-making bodies of the council. Um, so, first of all, going to apologies. Uh, we have apologies from Councillor Jenny Kent in the capacity of job share that she has with Councillor Revilius. So um, she is not here due to Councillor Revilius being here. So thank you for that. Um, we also have apologies from Ian Floyd. Do we have any other apologies? No, thank you. Um, the first item on the agenda is declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations, Councillor Eyre? Thank you, Chair. My day job, I'm employed by Community Action Bradford, who deliver the Health Watch contract in Bradford, and I do work on that. So I will leave the room during discussion of the Health Watch procurement process. Thank you. And Councillor Kilbane? Oh, thanks, Chair. I am a board member of Make It York, so I will remove myself from the room uh, for agenda item six. Thank you. Uh, item number two is the minutes of the meeting that was held on the 20th of February 2024. Can we accept the, uh, a, a fair comment and uh, accurate representation of the meeting? Yeah, so those are approved. Thank you, everybody. Um, item number three is public participation. And today we have two speakers um, we have one who is remote, and that is Flick Williams. So, Flick, can you hear me? I can. Good afternoon. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, so, I won't give you any 30-second uh, 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 reminder, and you have three minutes to speak. So, uh, you're speaking on items seven and nine. Please go ahead. Language matters. It conveys a shared understanding. The latest repetition of the phrase suffer with a disability in a written report tells disabled people that the shared understanding is that we are pitted, our lives valued by a metric of medicalised hopelessness. Councillor Kilbane has already apologised, but as this is not the first time, my focus is on how it can be prevented from happening again across all directorates. I believe it is telling of a wider malaise that results from a lack of understanding about what the social model means, and the only fix for that is disability equality training rolled out across the authority, not subsumed within DEI. Sadly, the problem with language goes deeper than the overtly offensive. On the same page of the report, the pie chart beneath is labelled, do you feel buses and trains are accessible to you at the moment? This language allows for the council's view of accessibility to be imposed upon us. If someone says the bus is inaccessible to me, the response cannot be, sorry, you feel that way. Inaccessibility is a fact, not a state of mind, even when it is caused by non-physical features. A better understanding of the history of disabled people's exclusion and societal systems and services pathologizing us for identifying barriers to our participation is needed. DET illuminates this also. And as to the next point, the further work on accessibility mentioned in the report, do not think that all of this is not having an impact on willingness to engage. Yesterday, an urgent appeal from the access officer about unfilled spaces in consultation meetings, an email sent to me from Mima telling me the, I'm the only person registered for the online event. Would I like to go and recruit some more disabled people to join? From discussions within the disabled community, I can tell you there is growing disquiet. I have no doubt in my mind that this administration genuinely wishes to improve upon the disastrous state left disabled citizens by the last. But we are being expected to do too much of the heavy lifting. There is concern that this latest consultation is just repeating the same questions we've been asked multiple times already. People are disengaging because in the course of two blue badge consultations, a cafe licensing consultation, a car park consultation and a city centre seating consultation, plus completing postcards given out at the barriers, they have repeatedly said everything there is to say on the subject. Please get out the Martin Higgerton Associates report again. All the work already done by highly respected access consultants. This constant reinventing of the wheel is exhausting the very finite resource of disabled people's time and energy. We already have huge challenges in our daily lives. 
Please stop exploiting our goodwill with unnecessary repetition and find a way to work smarter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Flick, and thank you for those comments. And I'm sure that um, councillors Kilbane and Lomas will take those uh, points that you've raised up um, where appropriate. Uh, the next person that we have to speak is Joseph Gilling from the York Cycle Campaign, and he wants to speak on the local transport plan. So you have three minutes, Joseph. Do you, would you like me to give you a 30 second warning? No, it's all right. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, off you go. Thank you. So as mentioned, this is a statement I'm reading on behalf of York Cycle Campaign. We welcome the interim report on the outcomes of the big transport conversation. We thank the council for the opportunity to participate in the conversation, and we recognise the efforts made to engage widely, for example, with young people and across the York area. The data collected from the online survey and from in-person meetings are comprehensive. We'll highlight just one example, policy focus area two, which was about improving walking, wheeling and cycling. 85% of respondents either strongly agreed or agreed with the vision and only 8% disagreed or strongly disagreed. 61% of respondents said they did not walk, cycle or wheel as much as they would like with the top three reasons given as a lack of suitable routes, not feeling safe, and a lack of suitable cycle parking. This is just one policy focus area, but it's typical of the responses received across the 10 others. Overall, it's clear that the result of the big transport conversation show conclusively that York residents want change. They want a city where it's safe, convenient, and easy to cycle, walk, and catch a bus, not a city dominated by cars and lorries. However, a note of caution, this is not the first council survey to show the overwhelming support for active travel and public transport. And the council's last transport plan promised much in the way of active travel and public transport, but delivered little. Cycling rates within the city have fallen and the current transport schemes, such as the Tadcaster Road and York Outer Ring Road, are not going to provide the promised improvements for active travel. So York Cycle Campaign calls on the council to move on from promising change and focus on delivering change. We want to see a local transport strategy that puts active travel and public transport first and foremost, but most importantly, we need to see the full and effective implementation of that strategy. We acknowledge that it won't be easy, Strong and determined political leadership will be needed to unlock the funding required to withstand objections from, and ideally change the minds of, a vocal minority who will object to change. There also needs to be a change of culture within the council, a move away from car is king, to putting the needs of cyclists, pedestrians and bus users at the heart of all transport decisions, and crucially, a can-do approach that's about finding solutions rather than highlighting problems. Let's hope this is the start of York's transport renaissance and we can look forward to the day when York lives up to its potential to be an active travel exemplar and true cycling city with Dutch levels of cycling combined with outstanding cycling safety records. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I'm sure that Councillor Kilbane will speak to some of those items um, in the, the relevant agenda item. So thank you for your time. Uh, item number four on the agenda is the forward plan. Um, can we approve that? Everybody seen the forward plan? Okay with forward plan? Yes. Yeah, marvellous. Thank you. Um, item number five is the procurement of Health Watch York. And to introduce this um, agenda item to us, we have Pauline Stutchfield and Joe McKayley. Um, so please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a procurement report here because of the value of the contract, but also the um, in light of the effect on communities across York. Um, the Health Watch contract is funded by government and it's a, a requirement. Um, it's a statutory requirement to have a Health Watch service. Um, there are options contained in this report about the period, 
um, of the contract um, and we re we are recommending four years to allow for stability for the um, successful organisation and to ensure that it can uh, recruit and rec retain staff for stability. It's an important service and paragraph seven describes the remit of that service, giving a voice to residents about the health and social care services across the city. And there have been very um, important um, recommendations made by Health Watch York to the Health and Wellbeing Board over the last few years that have resulted in change in services. So you're asked to um, approve the recommendation in the report um, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, would you like to say anything at this point? Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry I'm talking oh, sorry. to Joe McKayley down the table there. Not Councillor Coles. Um, the only thing I'd highlight, Chair, is that there's there's no specific efficiency identified against the contract value because we drove those efficiencies out two years ago when the last time this was procured. So it's a, it's a really tight value that's being offered. Thank you. Thanks for that. Would you like to speak, Councillor Coles? <laughs> sorry, I was Please far too ahead. eager. I was far too eager. Sorry, thank you. Um, uh, I really just wanted to um, pay tribute to the work that Health Watch does uh, for uh, residents across the city. Um, they uh, really do go above and beyond what might be expected of uh, a Health Watch service. Certainly, even in the short time that I have been both a councillor and an executive member. I think there have been 11 reports that they have put together, um, including really important insights into the mental health crisis, um, health and the cost of living and the dental health. Um, uh, oh, and actually also the pilot pathway for um, adult ADHD and autism diagnosis. All of those have um, really significant importance for residents in the city and are areas that they have both investigated and then uh, looked into how we can improve things for residents in a really constructive way. Uh, and they work really effectively with our partners as well. I really welcome the report. Um, I'm really glad we've been able to um, provide funding for the maximum amount of time because I know that for them, that will mean um, some security of income for the longer term, which is really important for them and their staff. Um, and I would just take the opportunity to thank Health Watch and everyone who works for them in the city um, because they do do amazing jobs, an amazing job for residents. And I think uh, they add to a really important part to the fabric of our health um, economy locally. And uh, I certainly always look out for their reports uh, and read them really carefully. So uh, thank you for the report, which I'm very happy to, that we're supporting, but also to Health Watch um, and the work that they're doing. Thank you, uh, Councillor Coles. And I'd just like to um, remind everybody that this is to go out to tender to Health Watch uh, York for four years um, within the contract. So it is a, a tender um, process, even though um, there are limited providers. So um, can I draw everybody's um, attention then to the recommendations, which are on page 24, paragraph 14A to D. So it's to approve the decision to go out to tender for the Health Watch York uh, for a four years contract and to delegate authority to um, the directors of customer and communities in consultation with head of procurement to take that, um, that procedure forward and then with the director of um, governance to determine and conclude terms of the resulting contract, um, et cetera, et cetera. So can I see those who are in favour of those recommendations? Thank you. It's unanimously approved. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for coming to uh, speak to us today. Um, Councillor Eyre, uh, perhaps James will not mind doing it. Councillor James is going to do it. Thank you for that. Uh, item... <laughs> Item number six on the agenda is uh, Make It York, the council's contract with Make It York. So Councillor Corbain's now going to leave the room.
And uh, we have Pauline here again to speak and as Angie Luslet as well to introduce this um, service contract renewal uh, paper for us. So please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Just a quick short introduction from me. Um, the paper sets out the proposal to extend the term for the current Make It York contract, service contract, for a further two years. Um, and that's to 22, 20, uh, 22nd September 26. And it also sets out the changes to the service level agreement, charging and the invoicing provisions, as well as the property arrangements and the SLA set out at Annex A. Um, just to note, at uh, paragraph 11, um, the new city, city centre vision will provide a framework for the future SLA for the Make It York um, to align not only to the new vision, but to the 10-year um, other strategies that we have that were approved at full council in December 22. So that's the climate change strategy, the health and wellbeing strategy, economic strategy, and these overarching strategies are obviously adopted within the one city for all plan as well, and they reflect the each principles. At paragraph 14, it's just worth noting the uh, budget implications of the contract. So there is a reduction of £25,000 um, in the next two financial years, noted at paragraph 15. And the recommendations are set out paragraph 18, uh, A, B, C and D. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Andy or uh, would like to speak? Please indicate now if you'd like to speak. Okay. Um, Councillor Coles, would you like to go ahead then, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, wanted to pick up a few things in the paper that I thought were noteworthy. Um, uh, obviously, Make It York have been around for quite a long time now. Um, they were set up under the uh, previous Labour administration uh, with the kind of ambition of enabling the city to operate, operate in a more dynamic way, focus on our um, assets as a city, the city centre and our markets. And, and I think they've been doing a really uh, good job of that. I think obviously there have been some really challenging times um, in, in that period that they've been operating. Um, but I think certainly um, over recent months, it has felt like they've been on a real, really positive journey, both for them as an organisation, but also for us as a city and uh, for residents in the city. And I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to pay tribute to Sarah and the team and make it York for their energy and their positive commitments that they make in the work that they do. Um, I, I found them really positive and receptive to um, looking at doing things differently and, um, and particularly the approach that they've taken to our um, request of them to look at income generation and how that they, we can reduce the commitment that we need to make as a council to them as an organisation. And um, I think that that's reflected in the paper under the financial strategy implications, and it's really positive. And I think we should celebrate the fact that they are going to be paying a dividend back to the council, which is extremely welcome. Um, I also just wanted to uh, draw attention to the fact that they are completely committed to um, ensuring that we can continue to have pride at the Knavesmire and that those really important events for the city are able to continue. Um, and I, I think another thing that I, people say quite often to me is, um, you know, about the city centre not being a place always for everybody. And I think uh, one of the things they told me recently was actually 40% of our city centre uh, footfall are residents and actually we should be celebrating that more um, and we obviously would like that number to be higher but actually our residents are using the city centre and are proud of their city centre and I think make it York play a really important role in in making York city centre a place that people want to both go as residents but also for visitors to come um, and spend their time um, and then finally I just wanted to draw attention to um, their, their commitment to the delivery, their part in the delivery of the culture strategy as part of that process, which is set out in the service level agreement, and particularly their commitment to making the most of our designation as a UNESCO City of Media Arts. I think those are really welcome um, commitments from them, and I um, look forward to working with them, as we have been doing over recent months, to move forward positively for the city. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Uh, Councillor Eyre? Thank you, Chair. I think just echo those thanks to Sarah and her team as well. I think at this point, to reflect on the, the snooks 
And what a fantastic addition the snooks have been, I think. I remember first seeing those on a small graphic. I was not entirely convinced what they were going to look like, but having seen them all over the city, I think that is a really fantastic addition. I think as with budget cuts to other key partners, the, the lack of engagement that has happened by this executive is short-sighted. I think the budget cut and the proposed changes in this contract do have the real potential to damage a key sector of the local economy. The future success of York's economy is intrinsically linked to our tourism industry, and great efforts have been made in recent years to boost wages in that area to encourage more startups and make tourism more sustainable. I think cutting support for Visit York in this way does risk undermining all of that work at the worst possible time, as the cost of living, energy prices and staff shortages are hitting businesses particularly hard. Reducing the contract from three years to two years is also a cause for concern. We do need long-term planning with our key partners. Fresh from ripping up the library contract, organisations across York with council contracts will wonder if they hold any value. Finally, concerns have been raised with Liberal Democrat councillors that if the council continues to cut at Make It York, it will impact on the services they are able to deliver. Residents and Liberal Democrats, for example, value our Christmas market and would not take decisions that would potentially put it at risk in the future. Thank you, uh, Councillor Eyre. And it's interesting you uh, see that as a, a cut to their uh, funding. Uh, actually, what it is, uh, given that they're a TCAL company and they were set up um, in order to be a commercial side of the, the council, is that they are supposed to stand on their own two feet. And that's what the process is that we're going through, is that they have agreed that they are almost ready, but not quite, to stand on their own two feet. And so we are really happy that Sarah Loftus has been able to move in that direction and uh, we're moving together to make that a reality. And I think that's a really positive thing. It's not a matter of withdrawing money. It's about um, creating that truly commercial um, aspect of council work, which is becoming more and more important. And having run a business myself, I would not be happy if I was having to rely upon income from a another that, um, you know, uh, was not assured. I'd rather be standing on my own two feet. And I know that's what Sarah feels as well. So um, in that case, then, thank you for the comments. And uh, can we move to the recommendations that are on page 38? Um, so that's paragraph 18. We've got A to D there. And so that is to approve the Make It York service contract extension for two years, approve the new SLA, uh, delegate authority to the director of customer and communities um, and their delegated officers um, to determine provisions of any documentation required. So that's in conjunction with the director of governance as well. And then finally, um, approve the granting of a lease occupational agreement to make it York the Shambles Market Site and Market Office, um, as outlined in um, paragraph D there. So can I see those who are in agreement with those? Thank you very much. That's unanimous agreement um, of the recommendations. Thank you, everybody. Um, right, item number seven is statement of community involvement update. So we have Alison Cook and Gareth Arnold here to introduce that to us. So please uh, take a, a seat. Thank you. Oh, yes. And Councillor Colbain is coming, I think. <laughs> All right, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the statement of uh, community involvement presented to you today um, sets out the Council's approach to consultation for planning matters, um, including strategic planning policy and development management. Um, its production is a requirement under the planning regulations and therefore it forms a statutory part of our development plan for the city. Um, the first SCI was adopted in 2007, but it has been kept under review and including a formal update in 2020 to reflect the COVID pandemic um, changes in regulations to consultation. Um, and we've been conducting consultations to this point um, in accordance with that um, SCI, but we do recognise that legislation and some and consultation methods and 
um, have have evolved since then. Um, further, we're anticipating a, a going into a delivery phase of the local plan, and we want to make sure that any consultation that is required um, is in accordance with it with up to date consultation arrangements. Um, to that end, we present an Annex Three, the updated um, report for you to consider. Um, a key change that uh, just a couple of key changes I thought I'd highlight to you from that report. Um, one in terms of planning policy documents is that we're seeking now um, to incorporate flexibility into our approach by developing consultation strategies for each stage of consultation. Um, we consider that this will um, ensure that that consultation can be crafted um, and targeted as necessary to make sure that consultation is effective as um, that that is effective engagement um and we consider all those parties um as appropriate um, and further we reference our privacy notices that are now published online for both strategic planning policy such as the local plan neighborhood planning and development management um, which we can keep under review um, more regularly um, and up to date with our legislative requirements and the changes to the SEI rule which also increases its flexibility um to that end we're just recommending um, consult citywide consultation on this update to the SCI um, as per the recommendations. Thank you, Alison. Gareth, do you want to say anything at this point? I think only to, um, in, in terms of the development management side of uh, publicity um, in, the, in the statement of community involvement, um, members will be aware that publicity is a, for planning applications is a statutory requirement. Um, we don't, uh, we don't seek to go beyond that um in the document um but it does uh it does allow for officers to have some discretion depending on the case, nature of the case and any objections or comments uh comments heard to take uh, any uh, additional um uh publicity requirements that they, they see fit thank you okay would anybody like to say anything on this item michael uh councillor pavlovic would you like to go ahead Thank you. Uh, I've just got one point of clarification, if that's OK. Um, Gareth, I think you mentioned, oh, well, both of you mentioned in paragraph 18, although not all consultations are statutory, consultations are increasingly becoming grounds for successful judicial reviews as they can lead to unlawful decisions. Um, can you explain why um, getting a consultation wrong can lead to a judicial review? or not doing a consultation can lead to a judicial review. Um, in terms of uh, planning policy, um, the SCI is a legal agreement. So um, for the local plan, for example, if we don't adhere to the SCI through the and um, its consultation processes as set out, or as we set out in this version, a consultation strategy that's in accordance with that, um, it would be it'd lead to a process judicial review. So we could be um, judicial reviewed on the process of consultation and those that we have engaged through that process. So it it would be after. For example, we received a, uh, a report and we'd be challenged on the basis that we haven't consulted sufficiently or in accordance with the statement of community involvement that we've set out. Thank you. In terms of planning applications, mm -hmm. um, if uh, if we haven't undertaken uh, publicity uh, as, as mandated, required by, by law, then that would be a ground for judicial review, very difficult ground to, uh, uh, to defend. Um, so, yeah, it's very important that we get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank Would you, you like to say something further, Councillor yes, Pasovic? Please, please go ahead. If that's OK. Um, and I just want to thank you for the um, for the report. Um, as, as always, it's a very comprehensive and detailed um, report. And, and I think what it does is it just evidences um, how important, and, and Gareth's just referenced it, how important getting consultation right is. And we've seen, I think, as a city, what happens when um, groups um, aren't consulted appropriately. Um, and, and I think um, our public participant um, was, was referencing, if you don't talk to people who have an understanding or an interest when a planning application comes in, um, you then end up making decisions that will 
both cost you financially, but also cost you socially and morally. Um, and um, and um, I think we have we've already looked at how we do our consultations since May. Um, we're taking a much more um, public health health focused um, approach to our um, to our applications and. And I've, I've, I'm very pleased to see that there has been really good engagement, and, and I'm sure Councillor Coles would um, reiterate the point that that health now feel that they are much more engaged with the process. So, thank you very much. Um, I'm more than happy to um, to support the um, uh, the recommendation in the report. I think that, that we've been given two um, two choices. Um, but I'm happy to support the, um, the the recommendation that's contained within it. Thank you, Councillor Pavlovic. Councillor Ear? Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief. Obviously, happy to support this going to consultation. And there's plenty of opportunity for people to feed in at that process. Uh, following on nicely from Councillor Pavlovic, there's just the two areas that I wanted to flag, one of which was health, because the reference on page 104, paragraph 4.10, does refer to public health rather than public health and health. And I agree with Councillor Pavlovic, I think, the introduction of the place board under the ICB, while I have many comments about how that worked in practice, how since that was set up, I gave a better opportunity to talk, especially to primary care, and have those conversations about how we plan infrastructure in health as well. So make sure that that reference is in there. And the second one, probably with my ward councillor hat on, it does make reference to neighbourhood planning panels. And if I achieve anything when I decide to retire as a councillor after going for 17 years, will be to try and solve that deficit between parish councils and planning panels. So... Hewitt has a planning panel, Hewitt without has a parish council. There is a gap in between that is unparished and not covered by the planning panel, so it doesn't get that. It used to come to the parish council and they would kick it back and say it's not, not in our area. And that will, I'm sure that happens all over the place. So it's if we could progress in any way forward of getting that solved. So either everybody has a neighbourhood planning panel or nobody. Great. Thank you very much for that, um, Councillor Eyre. So the recommendations are on page 66, um, paragraph 22. So members are requested to approve the draft revised um, statement of community involvement, which is Annex C for public consultation. And um, the consultation strategy for the SCI is delegated to the corporate director of place in consultation with executive member for housing planning and safer communities. And that is Councillor Pavlovic. So can I see those in favour of those recommendations, please? So that's unanimously approved as well. Thank you for that. And thank you for coming to speak to us this evening. Um, next item is um, item number eight. And I think Alison's going to stay at the table. Um, the item is delivering additional gypsy and traveller accommodation and improving existing facilities. And Tracy Carter is also joining us, so thank you for being here this evening and please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Apologies. Apologies sent from Neil Forrest who's on leave and Michael Jones and Catherine Daly who are both incapacitated. So I'm really here riding shotgun with uh, with Alison who's going to present the main body of the report. It does cover the uh, an update on the work that we've been doing to try and uh, improve the quality of our gypsy and traveller sites, but also looks at the um, the plans in the uh, uh, embedded within the local plan to expand provision um, on strategic sites, but also on on two of our three gypsy and traveller sites across the city. And it outlines some of the work that we need to do in order to uh, facilitate that to improve the conditions of of uh, of particularly the Osbolwick site. Um, and to uh, make provision for the delivery of the local plan with additional places. It also makes a recommendation to um, to, comp to uh, continue work with a of engagement, engaging with the Gypsy and Traveller community um, on um, addressing the uh, 
in inequalities that they face across a whole range of different subject areas. That's not the subject of, of this particular report, but the, uh, the place that residential uh, provision and housing plays within a lot of those inequalities is a really significant factor in um, um, creating better opportunities for that community. Um, and our work to improve the places where they live and to deliver increased capacity through the local plan uh, is a really important strand of our work. I think the two recommendations that I draw your attention to before I uh, ask Alison to go through the report in a bit more detail is the principle of forward funding, um, the improvement works and expansion works ahead of the receipt of the Section 106 monies that will be uh, that are coming from planning permission, permissions that have already been agreed but where the triggers have not been met and we don't have the money in the bank. So there's a cash flow issue for that. And then to note that a further business case will come back um, detailing the level of investment that is going to be needed to expand our own uh, provision um, when we've undertaken a staff, uh, stock condition survey and when the local plan itself has been agreed. And we know that that is the direction of travel for those sites. There's a second recommendation really noting the uh, the new resource we're putting into that team to work with the community to uh, consult on those plans once the local plans agreed um, and to look at uh, future windfall sites which might occur during the delivery of the local plan where uh, the best quality provision might be made. I think it's really important that, and, and Alison will touch on this in detail, that the importance of, of uh, concluding the uh, local plan process so we actually do have the capacity and the capability to deliver on that broader expansion of, uh, of gypsy and traveller provision is really important and, and, and being able to evidence that that is practically possible on our sites is, is a core cool focus of this report so handing over to uh, to Alison to take you in detail through the recommendations of the report. Thank you. Um, so um... As you're all aware, we, we are still under examination of the local plan and last week we had our fifth hearing phase um, to discuss Gypsy and Traveller policy matters um, to which we reference this report. Um, this focus, that hearing session focused on questions um, set by the inspectors regarding Gypsy and Traveller needs and provision of the pictures over the plan period to 2038. Um, so we've brought together this paper to try and ensure and sort of going over what Tracy was saying, um, incordation and pitch provision um, is considered jointly to support the, an early response to the local plan when it's agreed. Um, it anticipates moving into that delivery phase to implement the plan, as well as considering the accommodation improvements required at existing local authority sites. Um, for the local plan, just to cover some statistics uh, that we pick up in the report, we need to deliver 22 pitches within the short term and 38 pitches over the whole plan period to 2038. Um, and that's set out in our uh, Gypsy and Traveller housing needs evidence base that we have produced. Um, this is to meet both defined and non-defined traveller needs, um, which is defined against the national planning policy for this, for planning policy for travellers. Um, in order to deliver that pitch requirement, um, officers are recommending um, to executive that funds are committed to deliver the 10 pitches um, for divine, defined travel, gypsy and traveller needs um, and to forward fund the 13 pitches for which we will receive the S106 monies in due course. Um, that's set out in recommendation one and has details specifically in terms of costs on page 117 of the um, agenda report. Um, in terms of delivery, whilst we're currently identifying expansion at the sites of Osbaldwick and Clifton, um, Recommendation 7 also seeks support to establish a work stream to identify and assess alternative sites um, to support gypsy and travel accommodation provision. And we will be bench it is intended that we'd be benchmarking those sites against any new sites um, that would be coming forward um, for their suitability to ensure the investment proposals are robust. Um, in terms of existing accommodation, as, as Tracy set out, um, we're seeking to um, address funding requirements for the improvements on the council-owned sites of James Street, Oswaldwick and Clifton. Um, as set out in paragraph 28 of this report, um, we will need to develop a, the business case following the stock condition survey and, the, and importantly, resident engagement um, to identify the areas of priority investment. Um, we have identified that, that the, the potential areas of those investments could be around um, pedestrian access, lighting, um, improvements to landscaping and the accommodation blocks themselves. Um, recommendation one sets out that um, uh, approve, seeking approval for that for that business case. And we're intending that that would be brought before executive before the end of the year. Thank you, Alison and Tracy. Um, would anybody like to speak on this item? Uh, 
Councillor Pavlovic, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you for um, the preparation of, um, of, of this report. Um, as um, Alison has, has said, um, last week um, we had the, um, the fifth public hearing that was specifically um, requested by the local plan inspectorate um, to outline issues of concern that had been raised um, by the Gypsy and Traveller community uh, whose submissions had been made. Um, and it's fair to say it was a, um, a, a, difficult, a difficult session. And it was difficult because this is a marginalised group who have been neglected, underinvested in, whose health outcomes are significantly worse than the general population. Um, and for whom there's been an attitude of out of sight, out of mind. And the Osbaldwick um, Traveller's site is a classic example of that. Um, at the far end of an industrial estate, um, juxtaposed between um, a skip hire company and a brickworks, um, the air quality, the access, um, the conditions of the fabric of the buildings um, need significant improvement. And before, and as Alison has said, um, before we do anything around um, expanding th those sites, um, we look at any alternatives that, that, that are available um, in the form of benchmarking against the windfall sites that um, that may come as a consequence. And we, we don't know because we haven't had the outcome of the hearings yet, um, uh, of, the, of last week's hearing, though we are expecting it soon, um, exactly what the inspectorate will be um, asking of the authority. Um, had we been in control when the plan was submitted, as you, as you know, we wouldn't be um, preparing the, the, the plan that was presented. We made it absolutely crystal clear, um, both before the May elections and subsequently, that given the stage of the plan, um, we were not going to risk jeopardising it um, at, this, at, at this stage. Um, we are dealing with what we inherited um, and we will make the best of that. And part of making the best of that is saying we recognise that we have let the Gypsy and Traveller population, particularly those living on the sites, um, um, we've let them down. Um, we are doing what we can to address that. The investment of 5.25 million is a significant investment, um, but it's an investment that is absolutely vital um, for that population and for that community. Um, we are working with them. We are not doing to them. And, 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 and we really do need to emphasize um, that relationships of trust have broken down and they need to be rebuilt and we will do everything that we possibly can to rebuild the trust in the community that we uh, that the city has let down. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pavlovic, and thank you for all the work you've been doing as well, because I know it has not been easy, uh, um, neither for um, Alison and the team um, within a full planning team either. Uh, Councillor Eyre, would you like to speak? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Actually, we welcome the proposed investment to the Egyptian Traveller provision, as well as the continuation of progress on both this specific policy and the local plan in general. As is becoming frequently common, the process has, however, been unusual and far from transparent. I, I don't recall ever seeing an executive paper published by a third party ahead of it being on the executive agenda. Previously, papers like this and probably the statement of community involvement would have gone to the local plan working group first for them to provide comments and recommendations to executive. I would ask whether the local plan working group is now ceasing to exist. 
Without this opportunity for advanced scrutiny and discussion with officers, the paper does leave a few unanswered questions. And I do thank Alison, Tracy and her team for the work that we're doing this afternoon, trying to get clarity around some points. The draft local plan is clear that the best method of delivery is through strategic allocations, not through off-site contributions. This ensures that we deliver diverse communities and put all of our residents at the heart of their communities and near the local services that they require. This paper instead refers to additional increased off-site contributions, which adds further uncertainty, risk of marginalising communities, and opens a council to greater, greater financial risk. There is no historical evidence that delivery on windfall has been successful. This would suggest either there is no clear plan for delivery or that a site has been identified, most likely in the Greenbelt, which is not being disclosed. Given the number of Greenbelt applications approved in the last 12 months, since Councillor Pavlovic said there'd be none, residents will rightly be asking questions. The financial risk is especially stark given the suggestion that offsite contributions will need to be significantly topped up by further council borrowing. Prior to May, the council was committed to 10 pitches. This has now increased to 23, with over £1 million shortfall in funding. Which brings me to the final point. This paper and policy was clearly in draft ahead of setting the council budget a few weeks ago. Why was this £5 million financial commitment not factored in to that process? The answer is because it drives a coach and horses through the fictional narrative of imminent bankruptcy. We were told cuts to essential, vital services had to go ahead. There were no choices. Then two weeks later, £5 million of new borrowing and a further £400,000 per annum in new interest repayments in the interim. The reality is there were choices throughout that budget process, choices you ignored for political expedience, and that is laid bare in the underlying narrative of this paper. I'm aware of the argument that this is merely indicative of potential spend. Well, either it is just indicative, which will concern the planning inspector, or it isn't, which will concern residents, businesses, and anyone with a council contract. Um, just before I come back to Councillor Pavlovic and Councillor Lomas would like to speak, I, I, Alison, could you add in any of the technical detail, please, of the uh, the points that Councillor Eyre has raised that um, I, I fear he doesn't quite have the uh, full information that he needs? Thank you. Yes, of course. So um, just to go through in terms of the cost of pitch provision and the 5.25 million, um, we've identified that um, we need to deliver 10, we're, we're working on an assumption at the moment, which is what we've worked into the local plan viability work of £150,000 per pitch for delivery. Um, on that basis, that's the way that we've costed then how, we've, how we're delivering pitches across um, the different sites and the needs. So the 10 pitches which we would be um, delivering at the moment um, would be at a cost of um, £1.5 million, um, which is what we're asking um, the council to fund, um, to commit to the delivery of the defined needs, mm -hmm. which is our duty. Um, we have 1.95 million in S106 agreements that is pending. Um, two of those agreements are signed. So that's the delivery of nine pitches. Um, and then we're, we've got two in progress at the moment for the delivery of a further four pitches. So that accounts for the 1.95 million. Um, and the, um, the the remaining um, area is uh, budgeted for the investment and in, uh, of existing sites, so improvements to existing sites. Um, so overall, that would be a three. So we'd have we'd be recouping one point nine five million costs in S one hundred six um, at this stage. Is, does that clarify? Thank you, then? Alison. I really appreciate that. I'll let uh, Councillor Pavlovic and Councillor Lomas say something, and then I'd like to say something as well. So please mm. go ahead, Councillor Pavlovic. Um, just to try to address some of the points that um, um, uh, Councillor Eyre has made, um, given the timing of the report, um, it was not possible to convene um, a local plan working group because this paper had to be prepared um, in order for the inspectorate to have sight of it. Um, secondly, um, it was not drafted prior to the budget process. Um, uh, it, it came as a consequence of barrister advice, of council advice, that um, um, a, an indication 
of how we were intending to address the disparities. Um, and so that came after um, uh, the preparation of the um, of the budget. And if you talk to the finance officer, as we did, the Section 151, um, she said it is very common for um, new capital spending um, and bo so sorry, capital borrowing to be made um, in the course of um, uh, of a financial year. But finally, and 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 I, and I really want to stress this is that the the comments that Councillor Eyre made that I my interpretation of them were exactly the problem as to why the gypsy and traveller communities have been marginalised. It's, it's well, 5.25 million. Well, the public won't like it. No, of course the public won't like it. Um, the, it it's, but it is the right thing to do. It's the right, it's the right thing to forward borrow because, as he knows, Section 106 takes time to come in. It's it's only delivered when milestones are achieved. But as 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 as, as Alison Cook has said, those contracts have been signed. Those 106 agreements have been signed. If those schemes go ahead, that money will be delivered and will um, uh, 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 and will meet um, the obligations that were written in the uh, in the report. So. Is it the right thing to borrow, um, to invest in this community? Absolutely it is. I'm not going to apologise for it. I don't suspect you're going to apologise for it. And this administration isn't going to apologise for it. Absolutely. But it is the massive difference between ourselves and the previous administrations that we've seen for the last eight years. Thank you, Councillor Pavlovic. Councillor Lomas? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm really sorry that Councillor Eyre doesn't believe that safe and decent homes are a necessity and therefore shouldn't be a priority for this council. It's exactly what you said, Councillor Eyre. We, however, do think that everybody is entitled to live somewhere that's safe and decent. And where we discover that work is needed to deliver that, we'll make it happen, as we have here, even though we didn't um, put it into our budget plan. Um, because we didn't appreciate the horror of the situation until after we had set our budget. And you will see us take this approach where we um, increase our delivery of truly affordable housing on council land that is sold. Um, the investment we have made since the beginning of our administration in works on damp and standing water in our own housing stock, safe and decent homes are an absolute necessity and we must do whatever we can as a council to prioritise that for everyone who lives in our city. And I'd just like to add that the reason why the borrowing that is estimated at this point in time and will be firmed up as the uh, position becomes clearer is needed is because there has been an underinvestment, a total lack of investment for eight years Liberal Democrat administration, and we will not oversee that any longer. So um, I will then bring everybody's attention to page 113 that has the recommendations on uh, paragraph 16 um, points 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, which outline um, the approach going forward, including the indication um, investment estimated to be 5.25 million, and as has been uh, outlined already with forward um, borrowing on that. Um, and so we have um, in physical investment in pitches. Um, there's going to be a separate report brought to executive to refresh the council's commitment to addressing the inequalities of all kinds that are faced by the gypsy and traveller community that we have learned an awful lot about over the past 10 months and uh, again are a, a stain on the work that um, we are doing unfortunately and we will put it right. Um, we're going to note the recruitment process is underway for a senior project officer, gypsy and traveller accommodation, again another much needed um, and valued improvement. Um, note the stock condition survey has been commissioned 
to be completed in spring and the outcome of which will inform investment plans alongside resident engagement, another improvement that was not done previously. Um, and note that subject to further executive approval post plan adoption, a supplementary planning document will be developed, setting out design principles for pitch delivery. Um, and then finally, uh, to establish a work stream to identify and assess alternative sites to support gypsy and traveller accommodation using a benchmarking approach of the proposed Ovis Baldwick site expansion mm -hmm. and the associated health and social outcomes using a suite of site selection criteria to be agreed by executive um, against any alternative windfall sites because we must find the right place for homes for the gypsy and traveller um, community in conjunction with them. So um, please, can I see those who are in favour of the recommendations one to six? So that's a, um, unanimous. And I am glad that we have got to the point of being able to do this. And thank you for all the work that you've been doing alongside us to get here as well. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, joining us this evening as well. Uh, the next item that we have on the agenda is uh, agenda item number nine, and that is the uh, local transport strategy update. And we have James Gilchrist and Julian Ridge. I'm doing very well tonight, aren't I? Running through all the names here with us. Sorry, Julian. Um, so if you'd like to uh, tell us all about that, that would be great. Thank you. Off you go. Thank you, Chair. Uh... The firstly, the first speaker was right. There was some clumsy wording in one of the annexes to this report that didn't reflect the social model of disability which we've adopted. And as this is my report, I accept responsibility for that and I apologise. Um, turning to the report itself, in October 23, this executive approved a vision for transport in York with 10 policy focus areas identified to reflect our new council plan. Uh, as you'll remember, we then developed those detailed policies and had a useful discussion with Economy Place Access and Transport Scrutiny Committee about both the policies and about how we should engage on them. Uh, that then went to the Executive Member for Transport, sorry, Economy and Transport, uh, decision session in November uh, last year to approve those detailed policies and commence the consultation. What this report does is update on that very successful consultation and the response, uh, which was fantastic, really, given the very detailed nature of the consultation. Those responses showed significant support for the vision and the principles behind the policy focus areas. Um, Julian will go into some of the much more detailed and targeted specific engagement, particular groups that was undertaken in response to the discussions we had at that scrutiny committee. Just in terms of next steps, the next steps will be to work towards developing the detailed strategy um, we'll be publishing the supporting documents towards uh, delivering that strategy and working with the executive member for transport on that, Ident identifying quick wins, as well as a pipeline of schemes uh, that we need to provide to the mayor. Um, following that, we'll obviously start work, as the uh, recommendations make clear, on the movement and place plan, which has been identified in the council plan, uh, and that will be about a spatial approach to uh, identifying and prioritising the vision and the policy focus areas. Okay. Um, so this was the largest transport consultation in York for at least 13 years and quite possibly longer than that. Um, we received 1,342 responses to the online questionnaire over the 10 weeks that it was open. Uh, and we also received 35 paper questionnaires that we provided to members of the community who preferred not to use the online tool, but would instead pick up a paper questionnaire at an event or in the library. We attended 57 face-to-face -face events, uh, comprising two to 300 hours of councillor and officer time. Um, and during those face-to-face -face events, we saw between one and 2,000 people. We saw those events is incredibly important because whilst the online questionnaire is a very useful way to gather information, you get much more nuance and shade um, and ideas about people's opinions by going out and talking to them at some length. In many cases, 
the events that we attended were very carefully chosen to reach hard to reach groups in the community. Uh, this included school and college students. We did a number of school um, visits. We uh, talked to rural residents of York by attending a number of rural uh, ward and parish committees and also traveling on the mobile library, which gave us opportunity to visit some of the smaller villages uh, in the city of York. Uh, we attended many events organized by other organizations, um, including the York Older People's Assembly, uh, the Deaf Cafe and the Youth Council. Um, this ensured we talked to a really wide range of people uh, and not just those whose interest in transport was great enough to get them to come out and attend a transport specific event uh, on a winter's evening. So it was a very wide consultation exercise responding to the steer that we've been given in scrutiny. Thank you, Julian. Um, who would like to speak on this? Councillor Kilbane, I assume, would like to. Councillor Revillius, would you like to as well? Councillor Ayres? Okay, so let's have uh, Councillor Kilbane first. Oh, Councillor Revillius first then, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to James, Julian and all of your team, because this has been exceptional and a huge outreach to people all across York and it's amazing and really heartening to see the responses that have come back and the wealth of information that we've gained and learned from that so a really really impressive piece of work um, and it's brilliant to see how much support there is for those key policy areas um, and I think the one the thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is I've been working closely with Councillor Kilbane on this transport strategy because it's a crucial part of our climate change strategy um, and we need to reduce our carbon emissions from transport by 70% by 2030. So getting this strategy right and implementing our transport plan will be a key part of our climate strategy. And what we've looked at here is the feedback we've got from the members of the public and the, all that data that we've gained. There's some really, um, clear themes and areas of strong public support. And that's enabled us now to put in some quick win um, things that we can bring forward right now uh, to get things going, because we need to start cutting carbon and sorting out York's transport as soon as possible. So the quick wins that um, officers have brought forward for this paper center around things that we can get co-benefits from. So um, our transport schemes will not only deliver improvements to moving around the city, but also to public space. So we want to seek those opportunities and really enhance our public space at the same time. And we're also looking for opportunities when we have roadworks, we can use that time to actually build back something better. So when we're having repairs done, use it as an opportunity to enhance and sustain um, our, our sustainable transport and bring in other um, benefits such as um, sustainable urban drainage and uh, nature recovery solutions. So it'll be really useful to use that. And there's so many roadworks across the city, we can really start to make some improvements that way. And we can use roadworks as an opportunity to gather data, which will really help inform our future transport planning. Um, and we're also going to be looking at using um, the Active Travel England tools to identify and resolve some of the weak points in our transport schemes. So we're going to sort of beef them up and make them stronger for active travel. So there'll be lots more quick wins to come, which I'm really excited to see once we start to delve into that data and, and think about what else we need to do and what we can be doing over the next year. Um, but it's really great to see the consultation reached this stage and thank you for all that work. Thank you, Councillor Revilius. Councillor Airy, do you want to go next? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, welcome to the report and I'm pleased to see the number of residents who responded to what was a very lengthy survey. I'd like to thank officers who engaged with colleagues and attended ward events. As a group, we carefully studied the proposals and submitted detailed feedback. We hope this will help to inform the detailed proposals as they're brought forward. It is vital that the transport strategy reflects the needs and aspirations of everyone in York, regardless of whether they live in the city, the suburbs or the villages. 
It would be helpful, therefore, if possible, to have a breakdown of the number of respondents per postcode area. The report does refer to the funding that the previous administration was able to secure for active travel schemes and to invest in bus services and infrastructure. We all hope the Council will be successful in the future in securing the funding the City needs to deliver the ambitions in the report. It was encouraging to see over 50% of respondents saw e-bikes as important. Key workers in my ward use these often to travel to work and get to the hospital. Giving recent announcements, I hope consideration will be given to some form of alternative e-bike hire provision. Over a quarter of respondents said they would make use of a community transport scheme, a scheme such as the much missed dial -a ride cater for a specific audience, so this is not surprising. I would urge that this is not taken as a signal that a dial -a ride replacement is not needed. The report rightly notes that a challenge for new local transport strategy will be turning in principle support into concrete support for specific schemes. It will be critical that ward councillors, local residents and businesses are fully engaged as ultimately they will be key to shaping the future of transport in York. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kilbane? I'll go on then, Chair. Thanks. Um, I would... Uh, just before I start, really, oh, that's ominous, isn't it? I'm not going to go on too long. Um, before before I start, I would also uh, like to apologise for the language that's in this report on page one nine six. Um, uh, this administ when things go wrong, and we use the wrong language as we have here, um, and I acknowledge the officers' uh, acceptance and, and apology. Uh, but this administration doesn't hide behind officers when things goes wrong. And we 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 stand up there uh, and we take the blame when things are not as they should be. Um, I've got to say, uh, just for anybody uh, who is um, watching or listening uh, on online, um, the language uh, describes, uh, as the public speaker said, uh, disabled people as somehow uh, poor people who can't take part in. The world as we know it was actually the way this administration sees it is that the world disables people by not being accessible uh, to them and our job as a council is to try and change that now i can say that the, some of the officers involved uh, in the report were really beating themselves up over over this and i had to say to them look actually this is a really good learning point you know these prejudices are within all of us and when they come out it's time to hold them up to the light and say look what well, this is this this is what we're doing wrong here. It has a it has a poor effect on other people, a detrimental effect on other people, and we need to change that. Uh, and also take on board the comments that were made about it's not a feeling as to whether or not you can get on board a bus. It's a reality, uh, and I can see that the language there was um, uh, could be misinterpreted. So we'll 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 we'll, we'll do something about that um, going forward. To um, the other public speaker who uh, really majored on the fact that we now need to deliver. Hopefully, I'll cover that a little bit uh, as, as I go through this next short period. Uh, what I would do is I'd like to echo the thanks to the team uh, who've done an enormous, and I mean an enormous amount of work on this, a lot of it in outside of um, normal office hours, as it were, in, in village halls and all, all, all over the place. Um, sometimes people get a bit excited about transport and those conversations can get lively, uh, which I personally uh, think is 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 healthy but you know it can be quite challenging and we're prepared to uh, have those discussions and and so are the officers and that and that was great uh, i've also thank um, laura thornton who's not here tonight who has also done uh, an enormous amount of work in this and also congratulations to the team especially the transport team working on buses uh, because york is ninth in the country for uh, overall passenger journey satisfaction according to transport focus and actually is the best performing urban area in the north of England, if you don't count Stoke as being in the north of England, which I don't. Uh, and uh, so, no, so huge congrats, you know, to, to to the team who has delivered. As a council, quite rightly, people uh, pay their business rates, they pay the council taxes, and they, they like to uh, let us know when things aren't working out right, quite rightly, so they should. Uh, maybe we need to shout about it when actually we have got some things right. Uh, not perfect. A lot can be improved, of course. Uh, it's only an 84% satisfaction rate, so we can uh, we can improve on that. So thanks to the team uh, who are working on all of these things. And also thanks to the well over a thousand people who took the time to respond to quite a detailed survey. Uh, it needed to be detailed because we need qualitative information uh, that can really give us a sense of direction and where people are at and what, what people want. Thanks to everybody who engaged uh, uh, either at the drop-ins and uh, through the various ways that they could and online. So, you know, 
thank you so much for doing that. Your 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 views will be acted upon, uh, as you've seen from this administration. We do listen and then we act upon uh, what you tell us. Uh, and I would also uh, like to say thanks to the people who are already doing it, to the people who are already using the bus to get around the city. You know, you are uh, the congestion busters. You are the people who are making the city uh, a better place. Thanks for the people who are using their wheelchairs and using their bikes and walking to places. You know, you are making uh, the change for climate that, that we need to see. You are being the change that needs to happen uh, in the city. And loads of people are already doing it. Uh, and thank you to those people who are. The survey does give us lots of really useful uh, in information. So, um, uh, Councillor, I was asking about knowing, you know, where people were, were traveling from, where people were, were contacted. There is information in there already. Um, so page nine, for example, of the of the annex, I'll give them some detail on that, but obviously happy to share uh, the information that's in the report that gives that on a more sort of detailed basis, because it was a very broad, as, as, it, as it says in the papers, as you can see on the maps, it was a very broad survey that covered um, the whole of the city and uh, villages. And it's really useful to know where people's sort of journeys, time and how they're journeying and where they're coming from uh, is, 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 is really good data. Uh, it also told us the absolutely bleeding obvious, uh, which is good to see in print, which is the congestion in York is a major problem. And people told us it's a serious problem. Uh, the air quality in York is a major problem to people. Residents are telling us. They're telling us that uh, it is too noisy. They're telling us that they've got limited options for changing the way that they move around the city. Uh, we've got that information now. Most people who try and move around York already know that. Uh, nothing has happened about that, really, for a long period of time. I think this is... Uh, the biggest survey that's been undertaken since uh, Labour were last in uh, administration, actually, uh, because we take this seriously. This should have been done uh, a few years ago. The previous administration didn't prioritise it. It didn't happen. It's happening now. We've done some of the key work. And what the residents have told us absolutely overwhelmingly is that they're not happy with the status quo. If we do nothing, then it's just going to get worse. And residents have told us that they want change. So of all of the policy focus areas that, that, that we put out for consultation, at least three quarters of residents support all of them. Uh, and some of them, like making sure that our city is accessible to everybody, 90% of residents uh, support that. So it's great to know that the way that we thought the city was is actually, you know, that's coming through. You know, when you talk to people, when you've got a good feel for the city, the suburbs and the villages that that, that Labour councillors have, uh, what they're telling you, it's, that, that is borne out in a, in a, in a, in a substantial statistical uh, survey. So residents have told us uh, that they want change. That change will come. Uh, the next stage is we will start to put together the movement in place plan. So we will look at how we move around the city. We will look at the places where we live, where we go to school, where we go to work, how we get there, what those places are like to be in. Uh, and we will develop plans with the residents because uh, we need the people who are telling us they want change, uh, the overwhelming majority of residents to be coming with us as we formulate a plan that will change the way that we move around this city, that will free up the roads for the people who want to use them in sustainable ways who currently can't. So we will free up the roads uh, for, for public transport. We will free up uh, the spaces for people to walk, use their wheelchairs, for, for people to cycle. We will come up with a plan that will do the things uh, that residents have very clearly told us what they want us to do. And I've got to say, as a final word, Chair, because I've been avoiding your gaze, which you'd be telling me to shut up. Uh, as a final as a final word, uh, I just want to say, you know, it's a proud day, really, for uh, being a York resident, because you, you, you as politicians, we put our faith in the people every time we go to, to an election and we can carry on putting our faith in people uh, through all of our administrations uh, because, you know, people have got their heads screwed on, that they know what we need to do. Now it's up to us all, politicians and residents, to make change happen. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coolbane. And uh, I, I think this is perfect timing as well. It's really uh, good to see that um, we're starting to see um, indications of the transport settlement that come through to us through devolution and the combined authority, which will help us to implement 
the schemes and uh, change that Councillor Colbane has spoken about. So it's a very optimistic time. So thank you to everybody for the uh, work that you've put in and please pass that down through the teams as well. I really appreciate it. Um, so the recommendations are on page 155 and 156 under paragraph 12. Um, we've got A, B, C and D there. So that's to note the results of the our big transport consultation and uh, instruct officers to prepare a local transport strategy guided by the results. Um, and that new local transport strategy will be presented to executive for adoption later in 2024. Um, and it will form the basis about transport investment in York, which will take place between City of York Council and the York and North Yorkshire Mayor and the combined authority. B is delegate authority to the Director of Transport, Environment and Planning in consultation with Director of Governance and Executive Member for Transport and Eco Economy to publish technical pieces of work over that period, including such things as uh, York's bus service improvement plan, um, York local cycling and walking infrastructure plan and various modelled assessments for York's transport network. C is to request Director of Environment, Transport and Planning develops a brief for a movement and place plan for York and note that a further report about supplementary planning documents to the local plan will be brought uh, before members later in 2024 and that will include um, a transport supplementary planning document and then D, approve the proposed approach of delivering quick wins, some of which Councillor Revillius uh, pointed out, which will reflect, which reflect the results from the engagement process when this can be achieved within existing budgets and powers. Right, so can I see who those are in agreement with that then, please? So that's unanimous. You have your go ahead for your transport uh, strategy. So there you go, some more work for you to do now. So thanks everybody. Um, Thank you, everybody. And so the final item on the agenda this evening is urgent business, of which there is none. Um, so I bring this meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone.